I'm Jordan. And I'm Tyler. And this is the Inside Music City Podcast. Welcome to another episode of Inside Music City, where it's our job to talk to music industry professionals about the ins and outs of the music business. This episode was brought to you by our wonderful patrons. If you want to find out how you can become part of the Patreon family, as well as getting some behind-the-scenes content, visit us at patreon.com forward slash Inside Music City. Episode 10. We made it. <laughs> this is... <laughs> if 10 is what you think we made it, then yeah. we got a, a long way to go for Man. sure. All right. So this episode is going to be a little bit different than normal. What we're going to do is just talk about what we've learned so far after nine episodes. Um, we've talked to nine pretty amazing people that all make a living in the music industry in some form or another. Mm-hmm. A couple were um, instrumentalists, some were songwriters, some are like one's a photographer, one's a light designer. Yeah. Everybody. And they all make a living with music. And that's the dream mm-hmm. for most of us here in Nashville. For sure, yeah. That's why people move here. You know, that's they, what most people do, yeah. Yeah. And so all of these guys that we've talked to so far, they've done it. They've done it. And they taught us a little bit about how they did it. Um, and it was just really cool talking to them. So let's start out with let's see tyler who is who is your favorite person to talk to oh man one of your um, i mean obviously loved speaking with dave pomeroy he was just the the nicest guy and and so talented and and had so much insight and um just sitting down with him and getting to spend two hours and and learning from everything that he's gone through and like his his whole i guess life was just super interesting and and that was a um a wonderful learning opportunity for me as well, especially since I'm not in the music business or have a goal to necessarily work in the music business. Um, having that kind of outsider's perspective and still getting to, to learn a lot from, uh, from Dave meant, meant a lot. And then, and then <laughs> probably one of my favorite moments was from Eli Bishop, obviously when, when we, when he tried to teach us, how to clap super quickly. <laughs> that was one of our that was uh, crazy. <laughs> one of our first um, recordings that we actually did. I think that was episode four, mm-hmm. um, but that was one of our first actual times sitting down with people. And uh, so just getting into that and trying to just watching him do it so well. And then me trying and failing so miserably. Mm-hmm. Um, but listening back on that one, it's just really fun. And uh, yeah. What about you? What was your favorite? One of my favorites. I'm, I'm sad that you were gone for this episode, but one of my favorites was talking to Dr. Ensminger over at Belmont, just because we were friends before we recorded the episode. But a lot of the stories that he shared were, I had no idea. I hadn't heard any of this stuff that he talked about, really, besides his start with choir and start with singing and how he started conducting. I've heard that before. Um, But some of the other things and his different insights on music, that was all totally new to me and so i wrote down a couple quotes that i loved i called them the the musical philosophy nuggets from dr e one of them was when he was talking about how music invites you to be a participant with it i thought that was really profound and he touched on how his response to music needed to be defined because others didn't really understand what he was doing and so it was his job to explain it and i think i think that applies to performers of any kind really for songwriters with bands, when you write music, you need to react in some way that it causes people to say, oh, what are you feeling? And then through your performance or through your songwriting, you have to show them why it's making you react in such a way. And if you do that, it's a lot more engaging. And so people will love listening and watching, like listening to your songs, watching you perform. And that's not just for singer songwriters, singer songwriters, it's for performers of any kind, mm-hmm. um, whether you're an instrumentalist or you're up there on stage doing a play or you're reciting a poem, whatever it is, if you have a lot of emotion into it and it feels a certain way for you, the better that you can express that to others in a clear way through your work, the more they'll be drawn into you and the more that they'll feel connected. Yeah. I mean, I can't I can even 
count how many times that I have heard a song or saw a performance and felt an emotional response to it. And that's one thing that I love about music um, and, and live music in particular is just how connected you can feel with someone that you've never met. Even if you don't really have good seats, you're in, in the back, you can still feel the emotion that that they're giving out on the stage. And that's one of the one avenues or venues that you can get that response to complete strangers. And even if you're not close to them, even if you've never met them, um, you can still a lot of times feel emotions and feel what they're feeling while they're performing. And that's just... Uh, like I said, that's just one thing that I love about music and especially live music and performances in general. It doesn't even have to be music. It can be any, like, actors or any sort of uh, dance or anything. Just performing in general is such a... It can be such, a, like, such an intimate moment and being able co to connect with your audience is such an important aspect. When I When I do get that response or when I do get that emotion when I when I'm listening to music or watching music it's it's unlike anything else you can't really describe what that is yeah, and you just went to Bonnaroo yeah the, over the summer mm -hmm. could you tell a difference between the people that were really like connecting with the audience and the people oh, yeah. that were just up there oh yeah singing oh yeah and it's it's you really can tell like when you're watching a an artist perform there were some people that you could tell just really didn't love it. Didn't love what they were doing. Maybe they were doing it just for the money. Maybe they were doing it for other motives. But but you could the the people that did it because they had a passion for it. You knew who those were, and and they were the best shows. And just being in in a crowd of seventy five to eighty thousand people, where most of the people in the crowd and the performer and the artist on stage all kind of feeling that same emotion that's that's why i said that that's one of my favorite places on earth just because there's there's nowhere else that that you can connect with random strangers in an instant other than bonnaroo and there might be some other places and there are other music festivals and things like that obviously have not had that much experience with other festivals but uh but yeah, it's it's there's there's just something to it, and I don't really know how else to describe it other than that. A lot of weed. <laughs> yeah, there is a lot of weed there. It's uh, that's what it was. I, we were joking with my with my girlfriend um, how about how constantly the smell was um, like sweat, body odor, sunscreen, and weed. Ugh, just twenty four seven in there. <laughs> that's a terrible combination, but like that's part of the experience. That it is, right? yeah. You gotta, you gotta go and you gotta, you gotta experience experience that. a camping music festival at least once in your life for sure. Yeah, man. Um, another thing that I really love that Dr. E taught us was that it's never too late to do what you love. Mm -hmm. um, and he wasn't the only one that touched on this. Uh, we also had Dusty Draper, yes, who did this as well. Yeah, especially with Dusty. It, so <laughs> one one of the the things that I wrote down with Dusty was uh, just like you said, it's never too late to to do what you love and, and you can still be successful in your career um, if you start late. And I and I wish you could see me right now. I'm doing air quotes, air parentheses or whatever of over the word late because because uh, it's never too late mm -hmm. to start. And even if even if you are in a career kind of like what what Dusty was doing and then decided, you know, maybe this isn't for me. I want to try something new. That's OK. And you can you can be successful starting something new. And not only that, but Chris also really hit the nail on the head with talking about how you don't need a formal education to make a living doing what you love, especially in the music right. industry. Because Chris, he didn't go to school for lighting design and light production. He was just helping out some friends in his band. And now he owns a couple companies one of which is a very, very big and prominent light design and production design company here in Nashville. A great quote that Dr. Ensminger said that applies to this is, you learn a craft by applying yourself to it, 
And the fact that you're passionate and knowledgeable and knowledgeable about it will honestly be enough to be your credentials. And I think that's really cool. I know that I get stuck sometimes thinking like, oh, I need a degree in music or in performance or in recording to make a living doing this. But you really don't. Mm -hmm. You don't need to go to school for it at all to, to be successful. You just need to have a passion for it and lose yourself in learning, lose yourself in the work and your knowledge and passion will come out and people won't care about your credentials. Yeah. They'll just know that you're talented and that you love what you do. Right. And I've, I've been told before that like, maybe not in the music business or, or that industry, but any sort of career, most people, when you apply for a job, you, you write on your resume or you put in the application or whatever that like what kind of certification you have, whether that be school or technical school or apprenticeship or anything like that. But they, that's not what they're looking for. They're looking for the experience and can you do what you say you do? And we're not saying that school, you shouldn't go to school because right. <laughs> school is great and it's a wonderful way to jump start that career and to learn as much as you can in the quickest time possible and from professionals that have put that time into learning that. School is a wonderful um, opportunity if you do have that opportunity to to advance your career and to succeed later on in life. But if you do not have that opportunity or the resources to go to any sort of higher education, that's not a bad thing. You can still succeed and you can still have a wonderful life and a wonderful career, even if you don't get the traditional education. School is great, but it's not... It's not the only option. It's not the only option. Right. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. It's not the only option. So also with Marcus, just because you are great at one thing, so he's a he's a great songwriter. For instance, if you listen to the episode, you can tell he's written for so many amazing artists and he has so many um, writing credits on a bunch of different albums, but he's not only a songwriter. He he's an artist. He he wrote a musical, right? Yep. Like that's insane. <laughs> Going from like writing a song to writing a musical and like working with publishers and that whole, it's a whole nother business. So just because you are good at one thing doesn't mean you have to stick with that one thing if you have other interests or if things come along later in your career and you want to like shift things a little bit, you can shift things, especially if you are successful at what you're doing in the first place. You, you don't have to be pigeonholed into one career you can expand your career and really take risks there's a ton of things that i've really enjoyed about making this podcast so far but one of the great things is talking to everybody and learning the specifics of what you should do mm -hmm. if you want to be successful yes. um, for example like as an instrumentalist mm -hmm. so dave eli and matt all spoke about the importance of building relationships with others um, especially as instrumentalists. One of the best things that they all said that you can do is go to jam sessions. So Eli told us that when you first go, just sit and listen for a while. You need to get a feel for how it's working and then you can ask if you can sit in with them and play a little. Um, Matt and Eli both stress that when you do start to play, you need to play the right amount. Right. <laughs> Meaning you don't overplay. Yeah, you, don't overshadow. you don't overshadow anybody, but you also don't underplay. Um, I mean, you are there to let people know that you can play, but if you can't play tastefully, nobody's want, gonna wanna play with you again. Right. I think Matt and Eli both talked about how after they got up and played, people started coming to them. And they're like, hey, here's my card. You don't need to go up to everybody and tell everybody in the room that you're a guitar player. Right. <laughs> Most people here play guitar. If, if you just go up and you're tasteful about your playing and you're just very polite, then it'll go a long way. Mm -hmm. um, another idea that Dave gave us is that if you go to writer's rounds and writer's nights, if you hear somebody playing that you like, you go up and talk to them after. Just introduce yourself and say, hey, I'm so-and-so. In Dave's case, he said, hi, I'm Dave. I play bass. I know it's not really normal to have a bass player during a writer's round, but if you'd like to play together sometime, here's my card. Mm -hmm. And he just gave it to him. He's don't be pushy, but just say that if they ever want to work with you, then they can give you a call. And then all Dave, Eli, and Matt, they all touched on the fact that the music scene here in Nashville has a really small town feel, meaning that everybody knows each other. And so if you work with someone or try to work with someone and you leave a bad impression with them, word will spread. 
and you'll have to work really hard to get your reputation back. Exactly. And, but the opposite is true. If you work with someone and it goes really well, they're going to want to work with you again and they're going to tell everybody else that you're a good candidate for right. the job. I know Dave brought it up and, and uh, many of our guests have brought it up that you have to be a people person. In the music business, you have to be a people person, especially if you're an artist. Even if you're not a people person, you got to fake it till you make it. Because if you're snobby or if you don't get along with people, no one's going to want to work with you. And that, that's unfortunately the way it is. I know, I know many talented musicians that are that way. And that's why they still are a waiter and not performing with a band. <laughs> I hate to say it, but yep. but that's that's just the way it is, unfortunately. That's true. And everyone that we've talked to that goes on tour, mm -hmm. right? The tour buses, they're like, yeah, you could be a great player, but if we don't want to spend hours with you on a tour bus, we're not going to hire you. Exactly, yeah. So make sure that your personality is tour bus ready. Yes, you have to be <laughs> able to, to live with them for a good three, four months at a time if, if you want to go on tour, especially... Because you're in a, what is it, six by three by three box like bunk? <laughs> oh, yeah. At the time, the like they're really yep. small and, and there's 12 of them or 16 of them on a bus. And you have to be able to like, com like communal living with your bandmates and with um, the people that are on your tour with you. And if you do not get along, it's, it's not going to go well and that'll be your last tour. I know. I know. One one of your favorite episodes was uh, with Garrison Snell. So Garrison and I were good friends in high school. We played in marching band together and jazz band together. He was a drummer, and I played tuba in the marching band, and I played piano and jazz band. Um, and he told us that he was coming to Belmont. He got accepted, and he was going to be a drummer. And we're like, oh, okay, cool. Like he wasn't the best drummer that we had in the high school, but he was good. He had chops. And then me and him lost touch after a while until I moved out here. I looked him up and I was like, dude, what are you up to? What's going on with life? What's new? How's Nashville? You know, show me around a little bit. And so he did and we, we caught up and he told me about his marketing business and about Crosshair Music. And he was, he was nice enough to agree to be on the podcast and share his knowledge with us. And so I took a few notes for this and so we're just going to go over them again with you so this is what to do to market yourself as a musician so a, a mistake that a lot of people fall into with marketing is that they only try to market their songs where he said you, you have to market yourself and your story and then your songs will start to sell so there's three things that you can do there's one build your brand two make content and three spread the content so we're going to go a little bit in depth. Number one, build your brand. You need to really have an authentic understanding of yourself. One way that, that Garrison said, one example that he said was start by sitting down and just writing out your experiences. So Garrison's was like, I'm 5'11", uh, maybe 5'11 and a half, white male, 23. I'm from Arkansas. Uh, so after you have written it all down, you review everything, you look over everything, and decide what you like and what you can make a story from. And that story is important because that's what you then can make content around. And, and that's, what, that's what sells. Yeah. And so when you make the content, it needs to have three attributes. It has to be good quality, has to be relevant to someone or to some group of people, and then those people need to see it. So you can make videos, blog posts, pictures, and anything else that you can think of. The content has to be authentic and it has to reflect you and your story. And he said that the best kind of content right now is video because it's the most engaged with. It has a really low cost per view on Facebook and it allows for a lot more emotion to be felt because of the combination of visual and audio. Right, and you with video, you don't have to leave your house if you don't want to. You can make amazing videos in like your living room straight from your cell phone. It's so easy just to upload a quick minute, two minute video on Facebook to sit on your couch. 
And then after you make the content, you have to spread the content. So you should be posting it literally everywhere. So there's YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest. And because I was curious, I asked him how often we should post. And he said that the frequency doesn't matter as much as being consistent. Right. But then he also added that there's essentially two speeds that work really, really well. There's either super fast or super slow. One of the things that he said is, are you going to pump out more content faster than everyone else? Or are you going to go so slow and make it so unbelievably good that they're desperate for more? Yeah. I brought up a scenario with, uh, with a couple of YouTubers that I watch. There are multiple people that I subscribe to that post daily content, that post maybe daily vlogs or gaming channels that post every single day. But then there's some that I love that post once a week, maybe once every two weeks, maybe even once a month. But when they post... I get that alert on my phone. I pretty much stop what I'm doing to watch <laughs> that video because yeah. it's like, it's so good that I'm like, I have to see this right now. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you want. You either, you either want to put out content a lot, like every day almost, or make it just really good to where people start craving it when they have to wait for it. So whatever schedule you decide after you post it, people need to see it. So if your content isn't spreading, then there's a problem. You have to make sure that it was good, it was relevant, and that the correct demographic saw it. Right, and that's another thing with Crosshair Music. He, he has all these influencers that, um, and we go in way more in depth, and if you have not listened to that episode, I definitely recommend doing so. It was an amazing episode. But the way that he gets people to listen to your content is just so ingenious especially if you are an artist or a songwriter or uh, anything like that, definitely check out Crosshair Music if you want to get your songs out to the right demographic because Crosshair Music can make it happen. Absolutely. If you haven't listened to our previous episodes, please go back and listen to them because there's a lot of really good knowledge in there and a lot of tips and a lot of advice to get you from where you are now to making a living with music anywhere in music because with dusty he loved photography mm -hmm. and so now he shoots concerts yeah. <laughs> he, he goes to cma fest and gets to go backstage and gets to go where all the press goes and take a bunch of pictures you know for cma i learned way more than i even thought i was going to learn because <laughs> when like i don't know if you know the story or not about how we started doing this podcast when jordan first came to me and was like hey do you want to do this i was like that sounds like a lot of fun i had no idea that it would it would get to this point to where i know so much that like i don't even know what to do with all this knowledge and so i'm so glad that it's being recorded that it's being put on the internet for for you guys to listen to and uh and if you, if you know anybody else that might want to listen to these episodes or might want to, to learn this from the professionals, definitely share the, uh, the episodes that you liked, like our Facebook page, uh, contact us on there. It's, it's super simple. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah. And no Inside Music City podcast episode would be complete without rapid fire questions. Oh, goodness. So I am going to ask it. Tyler some rapid-fire questions. I didn't know we were doing this. I know. Okay. <laughs> On purpose, I didn't oh. tell you. Goodness. Um, so, we're going to start with what is your guilty pleasure? Oh, my guilty pleasure. Oh, man. Um, I like Taylor Swift. Her new album? Her, I do, her, her new single? I do like it. Both of them. Today. Yeah. Like... I like both of them because the new one, but we're recording this today and obviously, obviously <laughs> but the, the new single, the second single from her new album that just dropped, and I, I'm in love with it. Like it's so great. And, and I am definitely in the minority of my friends that actually like the first single as well. But, uh, that's my guilty pleasure. Taylor Swift. Good, <laughs> good guilty pleasure. <laughs> Taylor, if you're hearing this. Yeah. Find us on Inside Music City on yeah. Facebook. <laughs> Hit us up on Instagram. Like Send our posts. Like our <laughs> please. <laughs> Taylor, please. <laughs> We're begging you. Um, what is something that you're not very good at? Oh, goodness. I'm not very good at... I'm not very good at keeping my room clean. That's something that I pretty constantly have to 
be like, yeah, I need to clean my room again. Like, I just cleaned it two days ago, but it's already messy again. Just means that you live there. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's all. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm working on it. On a scale of 1 to 10, how weird are you? Oh, goodness. I am definitely out of the range, I think. I would agree. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty, we- I'm pretty weird. <laughs> um, definitely at least a 5 out of 7. Perfect score. <laughs> it's a perfect score. Perfect score. score. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then, finally, mm-hmm. what is your plan in the event of a zombie apocalypse? <sighs> My plan, let's see. I would... Uh, I would... Go to my brother-in-law's house. Hopefully, he let me in. Um, and because he has weapons, he has safes. And we would get some weapons. Maybe uh, go then to relatives, I guess. Mm -hmm. Pick them up in our cars. Go then just like maybe out in the country or something or like go to the mountains and just kind of rough it hopefully and mm. be try to survive off the land mm. i don't know <laughs> i went hunting once um i shot a deer i don't did really, you actually shoot it i did oh wow yeah i just shot at it no i shot it okay first my first ever time hunting I killed a deer. Wow. Um, That's impressive. And yeah, me and my, my stepfather, we took it back and we gutted it and we cleaned it. And um, the one thing that I learned from that whole experience is I never want to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm glad that I know that I can, I guess. Right. But if, it's going to be rough. So if need be. If the zombie apocalypse happens... I'm, you can live off the land. I just hope sort. that other people that I'm with like hunting better than I do. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Do you remember Matt's response when we asked him that? Oh, get get bit. To get bit, yeah. Yeah, he would go outside <laughs> and just get bit and join the Probably forces. just join them. Just join them as quick <laughs> as possible because he knew he wasn't going to survive any, oh, any longer. That was my favorite. <laughs> yeah. That was my favorite response of all. That was great. I remember that. Yeah. Wow. Well, hey, this was this was awesome. I'm glad. I th- I think every once in a while we should sit down and go over previous episodes and uh, just do like a one on one type of type of conversation. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on the show. <laughs> Thanks for having me on the show too. <laughs> Yeah, and for everyone listening, if you have any suggestions on what your favorite kind of episode was, yes. um, who were some of your favorite people to talk to. Let us know because we want to make this show as awesome as possible for you guys. Um, so let us know what yeah, you guys sure. want, and we're gonna keep doing this until yeah, until something stops us. And so I think we'll have these reflective what we've learned episodes every ten. Yeah, that sounds like a so. good idea. Let us know what you guys think. We love talking to you guys. We love hearing from you. We really do. Hey everybody, just a few more things before you take off. This episode was brought to you by our patrons. If you want to learn more about becoming part of the Patreon family and how you can unlock behind the scenes content, you can find us at www.patreon.com slash Inside Music City. If you enjoy this episode, you can go to our Facebook page or our Instagram and let us know. Our page is facebook.com slash Inside Music City or instagram.com forward slash Inside Music City. And finally, if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with someone that you think would also enjoy listening to or learning from our conversation today. Thanks, everyone. You're awesome.